you don't need living bacteria to have endotoxin. It's the physical presence of the endotoxin that can cause the problems. Endotoxin is one of many pyrogens, but it's probably the most potent of the pyrogens in terms of its activity in the body if it's there. The future, like a lot of things, is going recombinant. Hi everyone, welcome to today in uh, the A3P. So I am with David Guy from CapCod, uh, associate of CapCod. So David, thank you very much for uh, having me. So I'm very delighted, that's one of my first uh, interview in English and I'm delighted to do that and I'm also uh, a big fan of your accent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as I say, I don't speak English, I speak Northern. <laughs> <laughs> so David, uh, can you tell me What is Associate of Cape Cod? Okay, so Associates of Cape Cod was the uh, first uh, commercial manufacturer of LAL endotoxin testing lysate. Um, it was developed out of research performed at the Woodside Marine Research Establishment on Cape Cod. Um, and that is where ACC has its headquarters, uh, hence the name and uh, we've continued to specialize in product products of uh, based on the limulus lysate for both clinical and pharmaceutical use. So there's going to be a lot of things to impact after that. So first, what is an endotoxin? Okay, so endotoxin uh, technically is a component of a gram-negative bacteria, such things as E. coli, salmonella, Um, and they form the difference when you look from a different microbiology test, the gram stain, um, gram negative cells um, are those that don't allow the stain to enter the cells. So, um, so that's where we, you get the difference between different bacteria. The um, component that's in, important to endotoxin testing and the pharma industry is the lipid A component part of endotoxin because that triggers the body into an immune response and given sufficient amounts can cause fatalities. So what you're saying is that in injectable products, so when you, after you've sterilized or you've, uh, there is sometimes bits of bacteria that if you inject them into a, the human body, it will trigger some fever and some like adverse reaction that we don't want. That's correct. Um, you don't need living bacteria to have endotoxin. If you sterilize, then you kill the bacteria, but that doesn't stop the endotoxin itself. It's the physical presence of the endotoxin that can cause the problems. So that's what's tricky with, uh, with them. So it's not only the sterility of your product, it's also the pyrogeneity of uh, the pyrogen. That's it, you say that? Yes, English? yeah. yeah. The pyrogen. So you have to be careful during the whole process to not introduce some pyrogen and then to release your injectable product, you have to test for the presence of uh, those, those pyrogen, those, endotox those endotoxins that are little bits of bacteria. And so how do you test the presence of those uh, endotoxin in the product? So the just to um, clarify the difference between the endotoxin and the pyrogen, because you, both terms are appropriate. Endotoxin Endotoxin is one of many pyrogens, um, but it's, one, it's the, probably the most potent of the pyrogens in terms of its activity in the body if it's there. That's cool because I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> pyrogen is anything that causes an increase in temperature in the body. Mm -hmm. So that could be yeast, fungi, viruses, bacteria, anything. Okay. But particularly the endotoxin is one component of the gram negative. So how do we test? Okay, so uh, in the past, the, the first test tests were the rabbit pyrogen test yeah. uh, where the a rabbit was injected in an ear vein with the finished product yeah. and they monitored for temperature increases within the animal. Because rabbits are extremely sensitive to the presence of endotoxin and... I think it's more uh, good luck than good judge, good science originally when, they, <laughs> when the test was... I wasn't around, I hasten to add, when that, when that was started. Um, but it was... It turns out, yes, they are similar in their responses <laughs> to uh, to the human, um, but uh, and that that was the first um, test that was done as a pyrogen test. So that would find everything that caused a pyrogenic reaction. 
Um, but part of the problem was it was a long, a long test. And uh, in, like a lot of new scientific uh, work or discoveries, it was an accidental find that within horseshoe crab and their immune systems and other marine animals, that if you injected them with seawater, in some cases, the, their blood, their hemolymph, would clot. Uh, turns out, to cut a long story short, that the, um, the lysate um, that we use now is um, a component of its single cell that it has in its blood that it uses as its own immune system. It protects against bacteria, yeast and fungi. So for the uh, following on from the research that was done there, the first commercial lysates I think were made in the late 70s mm -hmm. uh, and ACC was the first company to have an FDA license to produce uh, um, this this sort of product and that was a gel clot test so it, it at a particular sensitivity uh, if there was endotoxin at that value or above a clot would form in the tube and the simple test was to invert the tube if the clot stayed at the bottom or now the top no good. Um, it was uh, positive if it ran out and gave you a wet hand it was a negative so good <laughs> so yeah that's which is what what everyone wants um, and like a lot of tests it developed through the years from a qualitative test the yes uh -huh. no into a quantitative test um, so you can start seeing if there are any issues before they become a problem. So you can see a rise in endotoxin before it passes the limit that's been mm. set for the product. Um, so we went from endpoint quantitative assays to kinetic quantitative assays. And of course, all these, as the assay became more and more used across the world, mm -hmm. um, then you're needing to uh, bleed the horseshoe crabs more. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not the same crabs more, but more crabs in general. Mm -hmm. But it's been very strictly controlled. Mm -hmm. um, we can't just go out and fish anywhere and fish as many crabs as we wish. It's controlled by uh, federal regulators. Uh, we need a license to fish uh, and take uh, crabs, put them back where we take them from and treat them carefully uh, while we're bleeding them. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about what happens to um, horseshoe crabs, particularly now there is a recombinant alternative yep. um, and it's, they, it's uh, beholden on us to help protect the species because it's it's a renewable, reusable resource for us. It doesn't make sense for us to deliberately kill the crabs. Yes, if you can, especially if you don't have to. Yeah, it's it's in a way you can think of it as us going to the Red Cross to give a blood donation. Okay, we can make a choice. Um, the crabs can't necessarily make a choice, um, but there are certain specifications, minimum sizes, the amount of blood that that will be taken yeah. um, from the from the horseshoe crab that controls it and it was controlled the fishing was controlled before we ever came along making uh, lysate uh, and the other companies that make lysate because it's it, its main uh, protection is because of a migrating bird called a red knot that feeds on horseshoe crab eggs the horseshoe crab comes out onto land to feed yeah. the red knots feed on the eggs while it comes out which coincides with the migration of the red knots from South America up towards Canada and the Arctic oh, Circle. That's cool. So that's the primary reason why it's protected. Um, and I certainly ACC have signed up to a red knot protection group because we don't want to have our activities impact on the um, survival of other species. So to sum up, first there was the rabbit, mm -hmm. then there was the lizard of the horseshoe crab and what is the future of this test? So the, f the future, um, like a lot of things, is going recombinant. Um, there have been recombinant reagents uh, for 20 years, or getting on for mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, but like a lot of things in science, particularly in the more recent times, the requirement for uh, cross-validation between an existing method and a mm -hmm. new method can take a long, long time. Yeah. Plus then you have the acceptance of the global regulatory authorities 
um, to accept it as a, a pharmac appeal method. And, and to date, the uh, early ones, the recombinant factor C, which takes one component of the total cascade that works in the natural lysate, mm -hmm. um, has just been uh, accepted by the European pharmacopoeia. But none of the other global pharmacopoeia have actually put it into their, um, their documentation. Um, on top of that, it won't then automatically get used because there's you, the companies themselves have to cross validate for every single product that they make mm. um, from new method to existing method. So you've got two stages of the validation of the method itself and then for each product. So it's going to take some time and natural lysate and recombinant lysate will be around together, I think, for a good, good many years. Um, so there's going to be a need for both. Uh, the recombinant methods um, will probably move forward. The more the regulatory ac authorities accept them, mm. the faster it will encourage yeah. the manufact the pharmaceutical manufacturers to to take it on board. So you told me there is so recombinant for the one who doesn't know it means that is uh, synthetically made kind of right. It's, it's made Correct. by and no need no need horseshoe crab anymore. Correct. And you said that there was two type of recombinant so there is the first uh, part of the cascade mm -hmm. that is the kind of old recombinant method and this needs additional equipment correct you've got the um, the, the reaction itself acts to amplify the signal um, that you want to see um, w within the uh, natural lysate that obviously works through the natural cascade that's in there With the recombinant factor C methods, then you have the first stage, the part that recognizes the fact that endotoxin is present, which means there aren't any further amplification steps inside the reaction vessel, for want of a better term. So the amplification needs to happen outside within the reader. Mm. And that's why a fluorescence reader is used with photomultiplier tubes. Um, that uh, amplifies the signal externally. With the recombinant cascade reagent, as it's being termed, the uh, amplification happens again within the uh, reaction tube. So existing readers used for kinetic chromogenic, kinetic turbidimetric readers, um, can also be used for the recombinant cascade reagent. So it's a simpler, um, less reliant on new equipment yeah. for, and helps the laboratory make a change. It's just a question of switching from one to the other and... In theory, no. yes, <laughs> without, without all the background <laughs> validation, but yes. Mainly our podcasts are in French, but for the people who listen to us, Uh, we are uh, we are a company that are dealing with uh, uh, quality quality system, and so uh, the company are giving us a lot of work by having a huge bag backlog of uh, change control. Mm -hmm. So, in one way, we are working with you guys to help you <laughs> moving yep. forward by uh, pushing the change control and helping the change control to go forward. But yes, it is a it is a very hard subject, and uh, I can see why it takes a lot of time. Yes, I mean even in the in the past, I think when I mean I've been in the uh, the general market area for about 30 years so from the 90s onwards you can see the differences in the requirements for change control for quality assurance and so on um, the it was in the past it was simpler to change methods um, I think it, nowadays what was done in the past probably require well certainly requires a lot more paperwork a lot more control than did in the, uh, than it did in the past and that's just the way things are the way things have moved mm -hmm. on but in in simple terms As you say, you take an existing product that's met tested by one method, you take the same product, same batch of product, test it with a new method. If you get the same result or similar results, um, so it's uh, whatever you're looking for, the recovery of no, a known amount of endotoxin, the spike as it's called, uh, is the same or within the required specifications. Um, then things are looking good. You would then repeat on two more batches. Typically, uh, three batches are done on a cross cross validation, and then the paperwork starts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see I can see more advantages of uh, using uh, a full recombinant uh, met, uh, region like mm -hmm. uh, like you said. 
you are also getting, uh, going away from biological vari variability of the horse crab, isn't it? Yes, I mean, a, a bit like you or I's immune system, um, each, each person is different. Mm. And similarly within, within the uh, horseshoe crab, Um, the pooling of different crabs' blood in the manufacture of the lysate will help even out some of the, the big variations. But even with the best will in the world, you will find differences between each batch. Um, you try and keep the differences as small as possible. Um, there are chemists in the uh, companies that that's their job to yeah. try and keep a, a standardization. But however hard you try, you will find differences between batches. And you can almost see it coming in cycles uh, through the years, that you'll have a, a slow period, then a fast period, and then a slow period, um, which then, uh, when it goes to the customer, they get used to one speed, and then they see quite a different one. And the first thought is something's wrong. And it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's different. Yeah, that's funny. And so is the new method. Hop. We are constant all year long. That's the theory, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it would make sense um, that if you're being able to control the manufacture of each component more carefully under using cell culture, then when you put those together to form the recombinant cascade reagent, there should be a greater consistency. And certainly the, the, the first batches that ACC made of the uh, Parasmart uh, recombinant cascade reagent, then you see a, a greater uniformity across them. They're not absolutely perfect. They're never going to be lying completely on top of each other. Like any product, uh, we are. <laughs> there's always going to be some variation. On the telly behind you, there is a, a movie that is happening. And so I can see some horseshoe crab in eggs and some horseshoe crab at sea. So can you tell me more about that video? Yeah, the, uh, there's a couple of videos actually on there. The first one and then uh, the second one shows us reaching uh, a milestone of having released one million uh, baby horseshoe crabs into uh, Cape Cod's waters um, and this is another part of our sustainability program so not only are we trying to reduce the amount of crabs we require we're also trying to enhance the population of the horseshoe crab in that area Um, the horseshoe crab, or the limulus horseshoe crab, lives on the eastern seaboard of the USA uh, primarily. Um, and um, they've been able to develop a method um, to harvest eggs and uh, sperm from the horseshoe crab males and females, uh, put those together to fertilize them, and then let them develop through the earlier stages of growth and then release them into the sea uh, with the hope that it will in, in increase the population of the horseshoe crab. So therefore helping the numbers of crabs within the, within the area um, and so help its protection. That's awesome, so you're contributing not only to yeah, hunting less, uh, like gathering less mm -hmm. horseshoe crab, but increasing the population by helping them to reproduce. That's right. And the, the, the technique is being exported. It's not just being, I believe they're also uh, trying to do the same thing uh, with different horseshoe crab species in the Far East. So thank you very much, David, uh, for this uh, very good interview. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, how can we contact uh, you if uh, people want, would, would like to contact you for questions or information or whatever? Absolutely. Um, they can contact me uh, by either going through the ACC website at acciusa.com uh, or they can email me at dguy, D-G-U-Y, at acciuk.co.uk. You also, I guess, I believe your uh, LinkedIn profile, maybe? Yes, I do. Yes, uh, you, can, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm not the most uh, prevalent of uh, enter <laughs> enterers or uh, reporting on there. Uh, but yes, I, I do exists. have a pro. It exists, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you, uh, Associate of CapCod. And uh, see you later for a new episode. Our pleasure.